We need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad. Behind me is the European Parliament, where I've been invited to give uh, an intervention relating to the Basic Safety Standards Directive, um, which is being discussed for implementation into European law, the latest version of this. Of course, the original one was in 1996. So I will go in there and I will talk about the petition and about the, the, the fact that the Basic Safety Standards Directive is based on the ICRP risk model, which is quite clearly incorrect and has resulted in the deaths of an awful lot of people. So, off we go. Absolutely true. 
But for internal exposures, for example, in this picture, which is from the French nuclear industry, we see an alpha particle, um, a, a, an actual solid, small micron-sized particle in the lung of a rat. And this is a radiograph. So what you're seeing there are, the, in that little star, which is called an alpha star, you're seeing the decay of, the alpha, uh, of this particle, the alpha particle decays into, into tissue. So you can see quite clearly there that some tissue gets an enormous dose and the rest of the tissue gets no dose. And this is essentially the problem. And this is the problem that underpins all of the problems associated with the Basic Safety Standards Directive. It was introduced six, 16 years ago, the original Eurasian BSS. And as I said, in 1996, the Greens held a workshop to discuss this. It turned out that the European Parliament has advisory role only. But what they managed to do then was to add a justification clause, clause in, into the directive as it, as it was ultimately um, produced. And in 1997, we had a workshop here, the Scientific Technical Options uh, A, whatever agency is um, outfit. Uh, called uh, Evaluation of Criticism of the Basic Safety Standards Directive. And this is all on the internet if you want to see what happened. Uh, what we had here was uh, Professor Alice Stewart, Professor Rosalie Bertel, myself, a few other people, and also the um, Scientific Secretary of the ICRP, Dr. Jack Valentin, who came also. And after the discussion where where many problems and criticisms were made of the, of the then basic safety standards, he said a very important thing. He said that there's no reason why you should listen to the ICRP. The ICRP, he said, is an independent body. It's a charity. It has no special status. And if you want to, you can listen to any other body that has no special status. And, and so we thought, good, we'll start up a body that has no special status, equivalent to the ICRP. And in 1998, we formed the European Committee on Radiation Risk. And by 2003, we published an alternative risk model which dealt with this problem in, of internal and external radionuclides. This committee was uh, supported by, by the Greens in the European Parliament originally, so it's very good here and very nice to, to be back here in this, in, this, um, in this same arena. But it's very sad that nothing really has changed. Because despite the publication of the risk model in 2003, and as I shall explain later, various other developments, which I shall talk about, nothing has changed. The, 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 the current risk model that we see, the one that we're discussing today, is almost exactly the same as the one that we had in 1997. Nothing has changed. Now, by 2009, the European Committee on Radiation Risk had acquired more than 65 expert corresponding members. These are proper scientists, I have to say, unlike the people in the ICRP and in UNSCE and in the IAEA, who, are, who basically are, are, desk, are desk men, they're people who study other people's work and select pieces of it that they like and reject pieces of it that they don't like. The ECRR consists of proper scientific experts who do research on the ground who have researched the effects of Chernobyl in the Chernobyl-affected territories, epidemiologists, radiation biologists, experts on genomic instability, which, which is an effect which has been discovered in the last 15 years, which essentially falsifies all of the um, basic um, ideas behind the ICRP risk model. Now, the most recent version of the ICRP model, this one that I show up here, has, um, has, is the one that's, be, that's being, um, being adopted and is, is the basis of the current Basic Safety Standards Directive. Inside this risk model, the effects of Chernobyl are barely mentioned. The, 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 risk, the, the, the ICRP um, 103 uh, document fails to discuss or refer to an enormous number of peer-reviewed and published reports which show that its conclusions are quite incorrect. In 2009, two large reviews of peer-reviewed Chernobyl health data were published, one by the New York Academy of Sciences, the other one by the European Committee on Radiation Risk. These show profound and serious radiation health effects in the ex-Soviet territories and in Europe. 
You can see all these uh, on the on the website of Europe of the Europe of the ECRI, which is up there, Europeum.org. The scientific secretary of the ICRB, who, whom we met in uh, in 1996, and who told us to go off and make our own committee, is Dr. Jack Valentin. Here he is. He was the senior editor of the latest report, ICRB 103 report. And in 2009, at an open meeting in Stockholm on the 22nd of April, April, after he had resigned, there was a discussion between him and me about the merits of the ICRP risk model with regard to internal radionuclides. This is what he said, and you can see him saying it on the internet because we videoed this discussion and it's there for everybody to see. He said that the ICRP risk model could not be used to predict the health effects of radiation exposure in human populations. You can hear him saying it. This is the model that is, under, that, that is the basis of the Basic Safety Standards Directive, which we're now talking about adopting into the European uh, system. He said, for certain internal exposures, the errors in the model could be as high as two orders of magnitude. So that's between 100 and 1,000 times between 100 and 1,000 times. We're not talking percentages here. And he said, now that he was no longer employed by the ICRP, and he said they can no longer pull my strings, he could agree that the ICRP committee and the UNSCIR, the United Nations Radiation Committee that we've heard about here, had been wrong in not examining the evidence from the Chernobyl accident and, and much other evidence that showed the ICRP model to be incorrect for internal exposures. In 2009, at around the same time, we had a conference in Lesbos, on the, uh, the Greek island of Lesbos, it's the third international conference of the ECRR. And more than uh, a, a, lot, a, lot, a significant number of, 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 of eminent radiation biologists and epidemiologists came to this conference and discussed at this conference the serious inadequacy of the ICRP model. And at the conference, they created and signed a declaration calling for national and international agencies to abandon this model as a matter of urge, age urgency. And here's some of the scientists. Yes, Professor Sophie Sawada. Professor Carmel Mothersill is the world authority on genomic radiation instability. Professor Yablokov was an, a, an expert who, who was a, a, an advisor on radiation to, to, Professor, uh, to, to, um, to the, the president of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev and then to Yeltsin after that. There are some very uh, eminent people here. I won't go through all of them. Um, now, the Lesbos statement which they made, the declaration, can be found on the Euradcon website, but here's what it says. It says, whereas the ICRP risk model is used worldwide by federal, state, and government bodies, and whereas a Chernobyl accident has provided the most important opportunity to discover the yields of serious ill health, following exposure to fission products. And by common consent, the ICRP risk model cannot be validly applied to post-accident exposures, nor to internal radionuclide material. And whereas the ICRP risk model was developed before the discovery of DNA structure, and that certain radionuclides have chemical affinities for DNA, so we're talking about substances like uranium, which bind very strongly to DNA, so they target the actual target which produces the cancer. So it's not a uniform exposure over the body. It's like a little missile that goes into the body and goes for the DNA and sticks on it. We, the undersigned, assert that the ICRP risk coefficients are out of date and their use leads to risks being significantly underestimated. We also assert that the yield of non-cancer Ill Ill illnesses from radiation is significant because what genomic instability tells us is that cancer is not the only outcome of radiation exposure. Radiation exposure causes every single illness and, and, and problem associated with health to human beings to increase in severity. And one of the main areas where this is so is in heart disease. So in the affected territories of the Chernobyl accident in Belarus, the rates of heart disease rocketed. People are dying of heart attacks before they can die of cancer. So if we're looking for some uh, increase in cancer after a major nuclear accident like Chernobyl or like Fukushima, we need to be very careful 
Because if people are dying of, can of, of heart attacks in their 30s, they're not going to be dying of cancer in their 50s and 60s. So the entire concept of the epidemiological examination of the effects of radiation exposure, and that includes the examination of, nuclear, uh, of the nuclear um, veterans of Hiroshima, it includes the people who've been studied with regard to radium uh, exposure, internal radium exposure, and thorotrust, and all of these studies, they are all flawed by the discovery in the last 10 years that heart attacks are caused by radiation. And so the, 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 the document says it urged the responsible authorities to no longer rely upon the existing ICRP model and to adopt a generally precautionary approach and in the absence of another workable model to apply with undue delay the provisional ECRR 2003 risk model which more accurately balance the risks reflected by current observations. Current observations mean facts. Current observations meaning you look out of the window and see whether people are dying after they're being exposed. You don't go to some risk model that says they cannot be dying. You do not go and look at children who are dying in nuclear power stations and say they cannot be dying in nuclear power stations because the risk model says it's impossible. You actually use that evidence to determine the risk model that is correct, and this is what the ECRR have done. So, we are in the middle of some kind of scientific earthquake. Valentin clearly was not prepared to continue to support such a system, and he retired. However, the ICRP model allows and underpins all of these radiation exposure situations. The nuclear energy fuel cycle, mining to license discharges to waste storage, military reactors, depleted uranium weapons use in Iraq and Afghanistan and the Balkans, uranium mining, nuclear weapons testing, fertilizer uranium, prosthetic materials, nuclear medicine, and finally, of course, why we're all here, the Basic Safety Standards Directive of the European Union. The European Union Directive that we're discussing explicitly states that its basis is the ICRB risk model. But because the 1996-29 version was a Euratom Treaty Directive, the European Parliament has no powers. But as I said, as a result of concerns about the model, the Greens managed to have one amendment added, and this amendment still exists and is retained in the current 2012 version, and this is very good. And this is very, very key position we're at now. This is the key clause that you need to consider. In this new directive, Chapter 5, Justification and Regulatory Control of Practices, under Article 20, which is the justification of practices, and we've heard what justification means, Mr. Mundi told us. Number 3 is this, existing types of practices shall be reviewed as to their justification whenever new and important evidence about their efficacy or potential consequences is acquired. This was laid down in 1996, so what we need to look at is have there been any new and important evidences about their efficacy or potential consequences since 1996? Well, actually, the answer is yes. This clause stops the BSS, or it would do in any legal system that was worth the sort. Because since 1996, hundreds of scientific papers in the theory of your literature represent new and important evidence about the health consequences of radiation exposure. Every single one has been ignored. Not one of them has been considered by the United Nations Scientific Committee. So in other words, UNSCIR, what it does is it decides on what research papers it supports its position, supports the ICRP model. And new research studies, peer-reviewed literature research studies, which don't support its model, are just ignored, are not cited, are not looked at. However, they still exist, and therefore, it as a result of this clause, it's now a legal requirement for the European Commission to re-justify all permitted practices which lead to environmental contamination and internal exposures. And in this, and this, is, this, is, this, is, this is a very serious matter. It is perhaps the worst, the most serious public health issue of human history. Because in the, and even in the 16 years since the Euratom Directive appeared, tens of thousands of people have died as a result of the permissions it gave to the nuclear industry and the military to contaminate the environment. Now, it seems that there is something that could be done about this. Any citizen of the European Union or resident in a member state may individually 
or in association with others, submit a petition to the European Parliament on a subject which comes within the European Union's fields of activity and which affects them directly. This enabled us uh, to consider in um, Vilnius last year, setting up a new operation called the International Committee on Nuclear Justice. And the first action of this committee in Lithuania was to draft a petition to be sent by European community citizens to the Petitions Committee of the European Parliament. And they began to, to, to use this petition and send it into the European Parliament at the end of last year, between about July and uh, October. And thousands of these have probably been sent, but we haven't heard what's happened to them at the moment. The petition focused on nine areas where the ICRB model was destroyed by research evidence. Peer review reports of the evidence are cited in the petition. You can find these reports on the website, in the petition. The website is, uh, is called nuclearjustice.org. But I, I, it, since it's so important, I will briefly review the areas where the applications of the ICRP risk model are shown by research to be unsafe and to have resulted in the deaths and illnesses of a very large number of people. Because it's all very well for me to sit here and just talk about this stuff, but actually out there, it's not just me, out there there are scientific research papers and studies that show that the ICRP risk model is completely unsafe for internal radionuclide exposures. So we'll start, I, I mean these are all very small writing here, so I mean you don't have to read all this stuff, and I should just briefly outline what's going on. The first one is childhood cancer in nuclear sites. Most people will know that in all studies of, of nuclear sites, uh, and in particularly uh, in, the, in the 2007 study by the German uh, Childhood Cancer Registry, there have been shown to be excesses in child leukemia in, in children who are living within five kilometers of the, of the nuclear site. The explanation always by the nuclear industry uh, or the regulators is that it's impossible. The doses are too small, they say, and of course the doses are too small on the basis of the kind of external risk model. But the doses are not too small on the basis of the kind of exposure to the kind of substances which are released from these nuclear sites. There have been increases in child leukemia in nearly all the sites that have been examined. The reprocessing sites at Sellafield, where this first started, in Dunre, which is another reprocessing site, La Hague in France, Near the atomic weapons establishment in Augenmaßen, I did that one. The atomic energy research establishment in Harwell, I did that one. Near Hinkley Point in Somerset, and recently the combined nuclear sites in Germany, and a study by Laurier in France, which showed the same thing happens in France. So if you live near a nuclear site, you have a, a, a two-fold excess risk of childhood leukemia. Now, for that to happen at the sorts of doses that they could possibly have got based on the idea of absorbed dose, the error in the ICRP risk model is probably upwards of 500 fold. So in other words, it's completely wrong. Now this sounds like an amazing number, but it's not an amazing number if you consider the concept of internal and external, of local dose and, and dose to the entire body that I was talking about earlier. But the second thing, and this is absolutely um, unequivocal, is that in all of the countries studied after Chernobyl, um, there were five different studies from different countries, they showed a statistically significant increase in infant leukemia in all of these countries, in children who were in the womb at the time of the Chernobyl accident. Now whereas you might say that in nuclear site leukemia clusters there might be some other problem, it might be some chemical that the nuclear industry is using, <coughs> it could be population mixing, all of these things have been suggested, some rare virus that, that happens to be near nuclear sites, but you cannot, you cannot bring these conclusions out for internal radiation from Chernobyl in the womb. There's only one thing that happened to these children who were in the womb at the time of the Chernobyl accident, is they got radiation from their mother, in the bodies of the mother, and so it must be the radiation that causes the increase in, in, in leukemia. And if you look at the ICRP model predictions for those sorts of doses, you find first of all that the dose response is not linear, you find that it's, it goes up very sharply and then it comes down again, because the children of course at a certain point they die, so you can't get leukemia if they're dead. And then it goes up again later on. Um, Using this ICRP model, the, the error is upwards of a 1,000-fold. Three, cancer following Chernobyl in northern Sweden. A study by Martin Tondell looked at uh, the cancer in communities in, in northern Sweden 
um, and plotted it again, plotted the cancer rates after Chernobyl uh, against the against the um, the, the, the cesium-137 contamination. He found an 11% increase in cancer for every 100 kilobecquerels per square meter, and that shows a 500, almost a 500-fold error in the ICRP risk model. A study by my colleague Harvard Scher showed that his human sex ratio at birth is changed by low doses of internal fission products, and he said as a result of his calculations that this, is involved, uh, this involves the, the, the death of millions of babies in utero as a result of these, these effects, which is found after atmospheric bomb testing, Chernobyl, and also in nuclear facilities. Now, there have been studies of cancer and genotoxic effect in Iraq, while the exposure to depleted uranium. I've been involved in some of those. These show that uranium nanoparticles represent a serious hazard. This is not incorporated into the Basic Safety Standards Directive. And indeed, a recent paper by Irina Gusevakanu, working for the French nuclear industry, shows that uh, in her studies of, of uranium workers in France, there was a very high level of both heart disease and leukemia and lymphoma uh, associated with exposure to uranium. And this shows that the effect, uh, it just shows an error in the ICRB risk model of 2,300 times. Then we have cancer, leukemia, and lymphoma. Not, yes, this is the one, Carmen just talked about that. French nuclear workers, okay. Then we have the secondary photoelectron effect, which is something that I have uh, studied myself at the University of Ulster. has to do with, again, uranium, uh, substances of high, high, high atomic number. What, you, uh, what, what it turns out is that substances of high atomic number inside the body, they focus the radiation and release it into the body as photoelectrons. This is a study that was made by my colleague, uh, my, my PhD student, Andreas Elsaisa. And you can see on the right, top right hand side there, the secondary photoelectrons that are released from a uranium nanoparticle after it's exposed to natural background radiation. The one in the middle is gold, and the one on the left-hand side is water. So you can see that uranium has a significant effect, and this is also shown in the studies in Iraq following DU, DU exposure, where there's a, a meltdown in the genetic, um, in, in the, in, in the genetic uh, base, the genome of the population. The, the, uh, the women there are, are, are having very high levels of, of congenital malformations in their children, there's an enormously high level of cancer, an enormously high level of leukemia. Uh, all of these studies are in the peer-reviewed literature. All of these studies are ignored by the United Nations. All of these studies are ignored by ICLP. And then, of course, we come to Chernobyl. The effects of the Chernobyl accident have been reported in the Russian language peer-reviewed literature since 1996. So that is to say they are new and important evidence, but they have been largely ignored by the ICLP and the uh, United Nations and the IAEA say that there are no effects except a few, uh, a few firemen who, who were exposed to very high levels of radiation. So these data are taken together, and they're all there in the petition. So if you want to see them and the references and everything, they're all on the website of the petition. They're in the petition that was sent to the European Parliament. And these together destroy the validity of the BSS directive because it destroys the validity of the ICRP risk model. The ICRP risk model is dead in the water. There is no question about that. And the only way that it, it, it continues to survive is because of this battle between authority and fact. So what happens, what happens is you bring a fact, a fact along and authority says, we're not going to look at this fact. This is how it works. And the, and the nearest thing to that is Galileo. Because Galileo brought along uh, uh, certain facts to the Inquisition. He said, look, you know, there are the moons of Jupiter. If you look at the play by Bertolt Brecht, uh, there's a scene there where the Inquisitors say, your, your telescope must be a very strange device if it shows something that cannot exist. And so Galileo had to recant, otherwise he would have been burned at the stake. But we don't have to recant, because we can show these facts to the authority of the European Commission. And because it is incorporated into the legal structure of the earlier BSS directive, thanks to the Greens, thanks to the Magic Amendment, they must legally do something. They must re-justify all practices on the basis of new and important evidence. This is a human rights issue. 
and it can be addressed as such. So under the, even under the European Union human rights legislation, citizens have an absolute right to influence decisions which affect the contamination of their environment. And there, there, here are some of the statements. Man has a fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. And he bears a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. And there are whole, there's a whole raft of these things. These wonderful human rights documents exist all over the place, and everybody ignores them. They're just pushed to one side. But they can be used. Here's the UN resolution. Here's the Aarhus Convention. Every person has a right to live in an environment adequate for his or her health and well-being, and the duty both individually and in association with others to protect and improve the environment for the benefit of present and future generations. Citizens must have access to justice in environmental matters. Now, I don't know how much time I've got, because I tend to go on and on and on, so you have to tell me when to stop. So uh, give, me, give me another three minutes just to go and finish off, all right? Because okay. I can never kind of work out, I can never work out how long these things take. I just put down my message and then deliver it. But, I'm, but I think my message has been more or less delivered now. I was going to talk about some examples of contamination. The one that is nearest to my heart at the minute, because I live in Latvia, is the contamination of the Baltic Sea, which is the most radioactive sea in the world. And this map shows studies, shows a health common study, this is all peer-reviewed stuff, showing that the levels of cesium in the Baltic Sea are uh, 50,000 becquerels per square meter. And there are various effects of this. I mean, I've, I've done a study of uh, breast cancer near the sea in, uh, in Stockholm, uh, in, in Sweden, and it shows that, that after Chernobyl, there were increases in breast cancer near the sea, uh, in all of the uh, communities near the sea, but in the communities further away from the sea, breast cancer rates actually fell. And then a couple of other concerns I'll just finish off with. The first of all is that the, the BSS is administered either solely by the European Employment Directorate or jointly between the Employment and Environmental Health Directorate. Now it seems to me that this is a public health matter. It should not primarily concern the Employment Directorate. Directorate. It should be a matter for the Public Health Directorate. So I don't see why. The, the Employment Directorate has such a major role in this affair. And secondly, the BSS aims to effectively abolish the concept of a collective dose, which enables the calculation of the cancer yield in exposure to large populations. Why? Well, the answer is obvious, because they don't want to scare people. So this is what I said about Galileo. What we have here is we have a situation where observational facts are pitted against authority. So authority comes and says, childhood leukemia site in nuclear sites? It is impossible. I am authority. I tell you it is wrong. This is, this is the situation. And we say, all of these people are dying in Iraq as a result of depleted uranium exposure. Authority says, it is not possible because the doses are too low. This must be changed. And the way to change it is to take the democratic power away from the Euratom people and put them in the parliament. And so it cannot be approved. The BSS directive cannot be approved and the parliament must demand re-justification of all practices on article, under Article 20. Thank you very much.